Um, so we are doing a second round of conversations that we like to call Pound the Pastor. And, uh, but uh, it was so great last week that there were so many questions, and they just kept coming fast and furiously. So we realized that there's more work to be done here. We'll do this as long as you want. You keep coming up with the questions, then uh, we'll just keep doing this, because this is where it really, the rubber hits the road. You know, to be able to talk about issues, to be able to find things that are sticking points for us, or things that we just need more clarity on, and, uh, and talk through them. And once again, let's be really clear. I am not giving you the definitive and accurate answers for everything. When it comes to spiritual matters, that's not possible. We can't know what we can't know here in this life. This life is made of uncertainty. This life is made of mystery. This life is made of paradox. And until we are comfortable embracing that mystery and that paradox, we're always going to be banging our heads against the wall and wondering why we can't cross over into a spiritual experience or just a physical experience that is characterized by serenity, that's characterized by contentment. Because as long as we're living in our heads, as long as we're craving the certainty that our fear is pushing on us, then we're never really able to just relax and let our moments be enough for us. That is really the crux of Jesus' message. You want to take all the red letters and bring them down to one bit? That's it. This experience of kingdom, this, this uh, apprehending of the Father is all about that ability to be completely present, to be vulnerable in the presence of each other and ultimately God's spirit. So that's what we're doing. We're just going to be talking through things. I'll be telling you what I'm convinced of. I'll be telling you what uh, my years of study and uh, standing on the shoulders of the scholars who did the real work, uh, what they have come up with, and we'll talk through that. And if it gives you another window on something that you can use, terrific. If it doesn't, fine. Take what you need and leave the rest. And if it's something that you violently oppose, that's OK, too. You know. We don't need to get to the same place intellectually. What we do want to do is get to the same place behaviorally. We should be able to stand shoulder to shoulder even if we can't see eye to eye. If we can do that, if our actions and our lives look like Jesus, then we're there. What is it that's broke that we need to fix? And that's the important thing. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be talking about some questions here and uh, I wanted to start with some questions that came um, this last week, and then we'll dive into what's coming in, in all of your noodles. But uh, the reason I wanted to start here was, first of all, because the first one was actually given to me before last Sunday, and we didn't get to it because you guys were just firing one after another, like, like pistons on a V8. Ooh, how's that analogy? Like, like that? Um, but also because then I got two more this week, and the three of them just fit perfectly together. And one after another, they're kind of illuminating this, this one idea. And so two of these come from uh, two of our folks from the Phoenix area. They're part of our, our virtual community on Tuesdays and Wednesdays. And the other one comes from someone in this room who will not be mentioned until he or she wants to be outed. And so I'll, I'll give them the opportunity to uh, see if they want to uh, remain anonymous or not. So here's the first question. What is the Aramaic translation for the verse, no one comes to the Father but through me, John 14, 6? It seems that evangelicals use this verse to exclude anyone who isn't their brand of Christianity, which definitely isn't about God's love. All right. Good question, right? Now, what is the Aramaic translation of this verse? Well, it's essentially the same as the English translation of this verse. It is pretty much what it says it is. No one comes to the Father but through me. And it is definitely exclusionary. But if we're going to understand how it's exclusionary, then we have to look at the first part of the verse. And then we have to look at the context in which the verse is placed. And then we need to look at the larger context of Jesus' entire teaching. And then it's going to start to make sense. So if you remember where this is, this is in the the Lord's Supper. And uh, John makes a big deal of the Lord's Supper. It's actually five verses from John 13 to John 17. And so this is verse, this is chapter 14. So it's sort of in the middle or the very beginning, actually, because the Lord's Supper starts at the end of John 13. So right at the beginning of the Lord's Supper, Jesus has told all of his disciples he's going to be leaving. They're freaking out. Wouldn't you? 
You've based your whole life on this man for the last few years, and now he tells you he's going to be leaving. And so at the top of the verse, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. He said, I am going to my father, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if it weren't so, then I wouldn't be telling you all of this. And so you know the way. And then, of course, Thomas picks up his hand. Wait, wait, wait. We don't know the way. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So that gives us a little bit more of the context of it. And, of course, right after that, then he says, if you had known me, then you would know my Father. And now you do know me, so you know my Father as well. And then Philip pops up his hand. Just show us the Father, and that'll be enough for us. And he's like, you can see him just about banging his forehead and saying, you know, how long have you known me, Philip? And still you don't understand. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You don't need to see the Father. You're looking at me right now. I and the Father are one. So in that first part of this verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. If we put that back into Aramaic, okay, ena urha, ena, I am, urha, means way, it can mean path, it can mean road, but it can also mean the journeying along that road or the journey itself. So if Jesus were to say, I am the journey, how would that change the nuance of the meaning there? I am the journey. I am the way of journeying. I am the manner of the journey or the path or the road. He also says, I am the truth. And a sharara. Sharara means truth in the way that we would think of truth, but it also has the idea of a right or harmonious path, a right or harmonious direction. And that which opens new possibilities, new opportunities, something that we haven't seen before. And so if you think of I am the journey or the manner of the journey, and I am this right and harmonious direction, I am the door that opens new possibilities or the way that opens new experiences for you. And then I am the life and a haye. But life, we can probably understand as the eternal life that he's always talking about. But not eternal life the way we think of it, just being a lot of life going on forever somewhere after death. But this would be life the way Jesus talks about it as abundant life. Life right now. Life that is always new, always changing, always surprising, always fulfilling. It's that kind of life that we have right here and now. Remember, Jews don't think much about the next life. They believe that there is one, but they believe that it's God's domain and we have nothing to do with it. Our job is right here between heaven and earth, and if we do that job, then everything's going to be fine in the next life because God is just and God is gracious and God is good. And so there's nothing about speculating the next life that really does us any good if we just stay here and now. So if we think about what Jesus is saying here, I am the journey. I'm the manner of the journey. I am the right and harmonious direction. I am the, the opening of new possibilities. And I am the life that is always here and now, abundant, full, fulfilling, new. As God says in Revelation, see, I behold, I'm making all things new. And no one comes to the Father but through me, through this way of living life. See, we're going to think of this ex exclusionary passage as, as, uh, as cognitive, because that's what we do as Westerners. We're thinking, okay, we need to understand Jesus theologically, conceptually, in our minds. If we do that, then we know the truth. And the truth is either right or wrong, right? And if we get it right, we're good. If not, we're not. And then we hear that exclusionary passage as being between heaven and hell, eternal damnation or eternal connection with God. But when you put it back into this context, we realize that Jesus is talking not about a mental concept that we have to adhere to that gets us into the place of saying that other Christians are following the wrong Jesus, therefore they're not saved. When I hear that sometimes from Protestant circles about Catholics or maybe about Mormons or even Jehovah's Witnesses, 
It's not about the theological mental concept that is making the exclusion. It's whether or not you're following this way of Jesus, this way of living, this way of loving, this way of connecting, this way that we were just talking about where everything gets out of the way and we're able to be completely present. And if you take this little section passage and you put it into the context of all of Jesus' teaching, it even becomes more clear. What is Jesus telling us? Pick up your cross daily. Deny yourself. Follow me. Right? Sell everything that you own and give it away. And then follow me. What he's telling us is that to get rid of everything that stands in the way, that is the manner of the journey. He's telling us over and over, we have to descend. We have to strip all these things away. Not because we're earning God's love. We already have that. Not because we're even going to the Father. The Father and Mother are already here. They're already now. We're breathing in the Spirit of God. But until we drop what's blocking us from being able to see that reality, to be aware of that reality, we can't go where Jesus is going. That is the fullness of what he's trying to get across to us. And that's the way that we can see this passage exactly as it is, not have to shy away from it, not to have to be in any way ashamed of it. It is exclusionary, but it only has to do with, are you willing to let go of everything that you think you know and own in order to be able to see what's right in front of you? That is the only way to fully apprehend, appreciate, be present to God right here, right now, and probably anywhere, any when, after the transition of death. And I thought that that led perfectly into this next one. He writes, my view of God has changed dramatically these past few years, especially these past eight months while attending your Sunday gatherings and re-listening to your teachings the following week in my car while traveling to and from work. I have had multiple aha moments and want to thank you for your insights while on my journey of discovery with you and my wife and my spiritual partner. Three or four years ago, words like meditation, spirituality, vulnerability, contemplative were all foreign to me. Now, 10 to 12 books later, <laughs> and uh, introduction to meditation with a meditation phone app, here I am. Now, like you mentioned in one of your past teachings, I have stopped using the app and have taken off the training wheels. And what he's referring to there is that I talked about we need to get down into silence, complete silence. Typically, those phone apps have a voice that is either guiding your imagery or giving you affirmations, and it's keeping your, your egoic head going. It's keeping your mental consciousness going. Or there's music behind it, or there's some sort of, of uh, environmental sounds. And that's fine to get started, especially for us ADD Westerners, right? To be able to sit in silence for 20 minutes would be like complete water torture. But to start with those, but then to back out, back out the voice and leave the music, back out the music and leave the wind, then back out the wind and just sit in silence. Because it's not until we get to silence and solitude and the stillness that comes from that and the simplicity that we find in that space that this transition really starts to take place. So he says, now, while in contemplation, practicing those four S's, right? Silence, solitude, stillness, simplicity. I now am beginning to understand my constant, crazy, rambling thoughts while focusing on the deep self, or true you self, or seat of the soul. My fearlessly vul vulnerable question to you is about this new place for me. What or where is that place? How can you describe and or deepen my understanding of this seat of the soul, this true self? I am convinced that the soul is God's fingerprint of you, lives in you. Is this that place? I now understand you are not your thoughts. You are the one watching those thoughts fly by. So you equals soul? And my second burning question, what's your favorite food? <laughs> Mexican. I started as a bean eater, and I will die that way. I'm telling you, love Mexican food. And answer to the first question is yes. <laughs> yes. But what, what do we call this, this? When we finally get to the point, as he has, and, uh, and in, in all this time, all the books he's read and all of the conditioning that we have been doing here at The Effect, but also the meditation that he's been practicing himself, that's the key. 
I love this because here is someone who has dug in deeply beyond what we're doing here, uh, either Tuesday and Wednesdays and, and Sundays, but also on some of the lunches that we've had together. He is digging in. He is experiencing his own journey. This is the only way this works. You can't just glean it from the outside in. It needs to be something that you are doing and experiencing from the inside out. This is the only way that you will finally get to the point where the silence and the solitude separates you from all of the stuff in your head long enough to give you a sense of stillness. And in that simplicity, in that simple space, because it's our thoughts that complicate everything, when those are off to the side, then you are aware of a deeper presence, a deeper you, a deeper self. What do we call that? You know, it really doesn't matter. Because as soon as you call it something, you've already stepped away from it. The first line of the Tao Te Ching, which is the, the great document of Taoism from the 4th century BCE, um, says that the Tao that can be spoken is not the eternal Tao. The name that can be named is not the eternal name. This is a recognition of the same thing that Jesus is telling us and the same thing that contemplatives are always telling us. As soon as you put a name to it, right? As soon as you think it, You've already taken a snapshot of it with your brain, and now you're looking at the snapshot instead of the thing itself. We've stepped away from it. We've objectified it. The truth of the matter is that this true self that we're talking about can only be experienced in real time, and only while we're aware but not thinking about it. That's the key. So what we call it is of much less importance. Yes, we can say it's our soul. We can say it's our true self. It's been called that as well. Some uh, call it the watcher, and I kind of like that, the watcher. He calls it the watcher in here as well. We used to do a, um, a consciousness exercise when I was doing um, spiritual direction for our treatment center. And the consciousness exercise, I'd have everybody sit and tell them, okay, think of a word right now. It can be any word that you want it to be. It can be buttered toast. It can be lambs. It can be anything you want. What you're going to do is you're going to close your eyes and you're going to sit there and you need to say that word exactly 40 times. Whatever that word is, okay? Popeye. You got to say Popeye 40 times. You can't use your hands to count. You can't assign a number. You can't say Popeye 1, Popeye 2, Popeye 3. You got to say it 40 times. And when you're done, and if you mess up or lose count, then you got to start all over again until you get all the way to 40. All right, and then when you get to 40, open your eyes, and when everybody's open, or at least enough are open, we'll talk about what your experience was. So that was a consciousness exercise. And so when everybody had their eyes open, I'd say, okay, how'd you do it? Well, some did it by grouping. You know, they wanted to do five, um, eight sets of five, or five sets of eight, or, or uh, 10 sets of four, so Popeye, 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 and then they'd be able to kind of keep track that way. That's all fine and dandy. You know, so we'd go through how that they actually did it. Some people did it with colors. It was amazing the different ways, depending on how they process. They assigned colors or something like that. And, and with others, it was rhythm. It was really interesting the way that people would keep track. But here's the point of it. I said, so your mind, your conscious mind, your egoic mind, is the one that's calculating, the one that's doing the counting. Who is it that tells you when the task is complete? Who is it that tells you you're done? You can open your eyes. Your mind is busy doing the calculation. Who is watching and overseeing that process and tells you when it's done? That is a little helpful way to think about who this deeper self is that is outside, beneath, transcending the egoic mind in all of its calculations. It's there. It's what we are trying to access because it's that part of us that is directly connected to God's unity. When we are accessing that part, not thinking about it, but we're just there, aware, we are directly connected to everything else that is around us and, and remote from us, for that matter. That's where we feel this connection with God, because that's where we are speaking to God with no loss in translation. We've said over and over, God's native language is silence. Until we get fluent in silence, we're never going to be able to speak to God directly without having it being adulterated by the translation. And so this is it. This is what we're trying to access. This part of us, if we can deeply identify with this wordless, nameless, pure experience of ourselves, then we can stop identifying with things that are going to be taken from us, things that are 
impermanent, things that are transitory. Because if we put our identification in anything that can be taken away from us, we're going to be set up for a huge amount of grief, and we'll never really get the deeper connection. We like to identify with our roles and with our accomplishments and with our attributes, all those sorts of things. But all of that is going to be taken away from us. We like to identify with our material possessions, anything that makes us feel safe. But that's all going to be taken away from us. If nowhere else in life than at the point of death, which is why we fear death, because what continues after that? But when we start to experience this deeper self that this questioner is talking about, then we realize that all the rest of that stuff are tools for us, important tools, our interface with the rest of the world while we're here breathing, but it's not who we are. And we start to realize that there is a deeper self that continues through all of that. Then we can start to relax in life. Then we can start to see the balance between the two, balancing between mindful moments where we are also wordlessly aware and present and connected. And then we go into calculation mode and back and forth, because we're going to need to do both. And I think that leads right into the next one, which really isn't so much of a question as kind of a commentary. But see how it, it completely connects with what we're just talking about. This is from Arizona in the desert. I think how tenaciously and sometimes how subtly we hang on to the material world our material existence to all our belongings, which are our limitations in grasping, imagining, and following Christ to kingdom. In other words, how all of our attachments to the things of this life, which is, of course, everything, blind us or limit us relative to kingdom. For instance, in the quote from the song, would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? My death experience was that I had no name, no identity. Now, I got to just stop for a second and say that this gentleman had I called it a near-death experience, and he corrected me. It's not a near-death experience. He really died. So he calls it a death experience. And he died on the table, and they revived him eventually. But his experience of that death experience, NDE sometimes it's called, was remarkable for me. Because of all the ones that I've heard, typically people who have near-death experiences, they, um, they come back ex uh, telling you what they saw. They saw heaven. They saw people they knew. They saw Jesus. And they saw imagery and iconography that you can say, well, they learned that in their life. It was part of their culture. It was part of their experience. And of course, that's what they saw. Is that really what this looks like? But this man was completely different. When, when he finally died, he was in total blackness. There was nothing at all, nothing to see at all. But there was no fear in the darkness either. He felt like he was being held. He felt like he was connected. But there was nothing to see. Now, what he just told us is that he saw he had no sense of self. He had no sense of name. He was just there. And he kept using the phrase, I was made to know that, which I love because it means that it wasn't in words. He wasn't told something. He was made to know something. And that obviously, there was someone making him to know something. So there was a sense of a higher power. There was a sense of a power outside of himself that was making him to know things. And one of the things he was made to know was you can go back if you want to, or you can go on. And the moment that he decided to go back, suddenly all of his sense of self was back. He was hearing all the noise in the crash room and everything that was going on around him. But in that period, there was just this free-floating awareness that was not tethered in anything that was self. Interesting, huh? So let's say, for instance, in the quote from the song, would you know my name if I saw you in heaven? My death experience was that I had no name, no identity. There are times when I find that looking at my wife as a stranger, in other words, without naming her, I feel even more love and amazement. It's like your suggestion of walking and not naming the streets or plants, just experiencing the sanctity of it all. Just see a person as a person, period. I find that fascinating. If he just sees his wife, and he doesn't take time to think of her name or recall their past together or who she is in his life, the roles she plays, he's just seeing her. He even has more love for her and feels more connection for her. This is important because to think of ourselves without an identity that we understand, without a name as ourselves, is a frightening prospect because that's everything that we hang our head on. But he's saying that there's even more love and more connection 
when that is just not part of the equation. People imagine themselves as a being, an individual with some sense of themselves. My experience was that I had no experience of self at all. There was no separation. It was only when I was made to know that I could return that I had any experience of me or having anything to return to. There was no name, no identity, no past, no separation, nothing material, nothing that we commonly refer to as real. But when people think of kingdom or heaven, they project their material experience or material attachments onto it. That is the camel that cannot pass. That's our baggage. I understand how incredibly difficult it is to even imagine, yet I don't think God wants us to imagine. I think, where are we going? I hear, just follow me. So I think, did you see how everything fits together from the first question? No one can come through the Father but through me. And what Jesus is telling us, it's an experiential journey. It's not a thought in your head. It's a journey that you need to take because what you will experience there is beyond words. And the only way that you can know it is when you put your thoughts and your cognition aside. And then you just experience. To the next one, what do I do with that? What do I call it? What is it really? And the truth of the matter is that we can't know. All we can do is experience it and keep coming back to that place over and over again and get more and more deeply familiar with that. And to realize that there is no fear in that loss of sense of self that is an actually a form of deeper connection and deeper love when we can do that. And that makes all the difference in the world. This is what Jesus is trying to tell us. Jesus is a mystic. I'm sorry, evangelicals, but he is. And mystic only defined as someone who is in direct communication in the way that we're talking about, spirit to spirit, wordlessly present, Paul was a mystic. He talks about going to the highest heaven. He had the, the transformation experience on, on the road to Damascus. I mean, those, are, those are mystical experience. Contemplative practice is what we do in order to get to the place that we can have a mystical experience. It's the practice of presence. Brother Lawrence over again, right? Practicing the presence, practicing awareness, practicing getting our head out of the way so that we can actually stand face to face with the presence of God. And then we can't name it, because if we do, then we put it back into the material world. We put it back into our cognition. But it's a beautiful thing. And all of the church going in the world, I mean, you can experience that here, of course. But to practice it yourself is the part that is key. Jesus is all about engagement. This is not passive. This is active. You need to do what he's doing, or you can't go where he's going. All right? I know I took a lot of time there, but I was just fascinated how these three questions just knit together, and I hope they give you a clear idea of what it is we're trying to do, what it is that Jesus is trying to show us. Okay? All right. Go ahead. Here we go. Uh, first, uh, we'll, we'll go with, uh, with Francis K. and then John. Does God have a gender? This is a question I posed when I first met you 10 years ago. What I appreciate about the effect is being able to see with new eyes, to let go of the limiting belief from my faith of origin, putting God in such a small space. But being so steeped in patriarchy, culturally, biblically, and all the references to he, him, with a capital H, father, is God a man? And uh, why, have, why do we have to give gender to a God, and why do we continue to use those references that are so limiting? <sighs> I think I like my favorite food better. <laughs> Great question, though. You know, and, and you know, not just from, uh, from Frances Kay, and, and I know her background, but I think a lot of you ladies have probably you know, experienced this yourself. You know, that, that stifling patriarchy, that, that sense that there's something less about you as a woman than there is about men. I've seen the heads going up and down. So from a Catholic background to LDS to evangelical or whatever, it's the same, right? I mean, obviously, there are many more patriarchal societies than there are matriarchal societies, at least thus far. And let's face it, the Jewish system was a patriarchal society. And so even though they understood the truth about their God, they still referred to God as he, him, his, 
and we're getting used to those kind of pronouns, right? And called him father. That was the way that they traditionally did it. But they also understood that God was mother, too. So the, uh, the various attributes of God were sometimes cast as masculine and then sometimes cast as feminine. So when God was acting as king and executor and judge, he was placed as mas masculine. But when she was cast as wisdom and compassion and mercy, then she was anthropomorphized as feminine. And that's what we're doing here. We're anthropomorphizing. Obviously, God is spirit. New Testament tells us that flat out. God is spirit, which means God doesn't have gender. God is neither male nor female, but also that God encompasses everything it means for us as humans to be masculine and feminine and everything in between. So God is the fullness of our human experience. Everything and all those traits that make up the full spectrum of human experience, human emotion, human connection and relationship is present in God. And so these ancients who wrote this scripture were kind of parsing out the different attributes of God as either masculine or feminine, but through their patriarchal system, referred to God ultimately as father and not mother. Now, I realize that that can be, especially for those of you who have had such traumatic experiences in the past, that can be difficult to keep hearing, you know. Frances Kay told me, I hope this is okay to tell, she's just said that sometimes it's hard for her to listen to the music because the lyrics are referring to God as he and him and father. And all that pounding over and over again can distract her from the worship experience. Now, there's not much that I can do about the music. It is what it is, although I've been trying to pick songs that are much more neutral. And in my own speech and in my writing especially, I'm trying to just eliminate pronouns altogether or find ways of working around this so it isn't so masculine all the time because I realize what's going on out there. But I also realize that if I start referring to God as mother and she, it's going to trigger probably more of you than if I refer to him as father and he because that is a, a, a long-standing uh, just habit that we've formed. And it's jarring to hear mother God. It's jarring to hear she. Now, you all know that every Mother's Day and Father's Day, I do messages on this subject, trying to get people to understand that the Jews knew that God was both or neither. And so we're trying to, be, to reincorporate the, the, the feminine side of God and bring it up as equal and balanced because it should be in all of our minds. And Jesus himself was someone who revered women. Paul even revered women, as misogynistic as he sometimes seemed, because he tells women to keep your head covered and don't teach a man, which is now a big deal over at Saddleback, right? And, uh, and all the things that he's done. And yet he was the one who put Priscilla and other women in places of actual leadership. He was the one who did that. We don't hear it from any of the other apostles, but we got it from Paul. And Jesus, of course, revered women saw them in positions of leadership. And so Jesus is bringing in, in, the, in the course of his life, in the course of his choices and his relationship, he's showing that women are just as important as men in everything that he's doing in terms of his ministry, in terms of his life. And so that's the way that we need to approach this. I don't know, maybe we can decide as a, as a group you know, how we want to try to refer to God that's more inclusive and doesn't trigger but whatever we do, we're going to trigger somebody. But at least if you know that this is the basic belief system within Christianity, what did the Catholics do? They revered Mary. That was their way of balancing out male and female. Mary is considered the co-redemptrix with Jesus. The two work together. And the, and the veneration of Mary is the wisdom and the compassion and the mercy side of God. Didn't translate into the Protestant branch, but it's, it's there in the Roman Catholic and the Eastern Orthodox where Mary is elevated to a higher position. So it's there in our tradition, but it is buried. And it's up to us to make sure that however we decide to refer to God and however we decide to carry on, that we never marginalize anybody and that we are always trying to get everybody to know that, yes, God is neither and both. And there is no subjugation. Even though we're supposed to be in mutual submission, there should never be subjugation of anybody, ever, for any reason. That would violate Jesus completely. Is that enough for now, dear? Okay. 
I know it, it's still going to be difficult, and your, things are going to tick in your head. But you know, come talk to me about it if, if it's a, if an issue. And you know, I, I'd love to hear from you and just just one on one talk more about this because it's a, it's an important thing. We want everyone to feel included. Everyone should feel included by the gospel and by these scriptures. And if not, then we're doing something wrong. Okay. All right. Oh, John. Oh, we need to, yeah. Yes, you do, because there's people listening over the, uh, over the stream. And, and we want to let uh, Scotty do the Phil Donahue thing. You know, he loves it, so. Well, this is a simple question. If someone comes to me and says, I'd like to be a Christian, what do I say or do? To them. Okay. Now, I know where you're coming from with this. I know you do. Yeah. <laughs> so he's coming from an evangelical point of view. And uh, can, can I tell a little bit about our conversation? Okay. He basically said, I'm an old guy, I'm an evangelical, and I'm going to die an evangelical and an old guy. And so, you know, I believe that, that you have to say the sinner's prayer and that you get baptized and then you're able to go to heaven and so on and so forth. And, you know, what I told him was, this guy is one of the, the, the people that I know who is living in kind of the most serenity and contentment at this point in his life of anybody I know. What in the world is broken that I would want to fix in him? not a darn thing, that he and I may see things a little differently, and we don't see it that much differently anyway. It's going to be more of a matter of semantics anyway. But that there is maybe not the exact eye-to-eye -eye idea here conceptually or theologically doesn't bother me in the least, because I see in him kingdom. And that's the way it is for every one of us. It's not what we understand that either saves us, and it's not that what we understand proves our allegiance to Jesus, that we're following him, that we're Christian at all. It's what we do. It's how we act and how we love. That's exactly what Jesus told us. You know, they're going to know you're my followers by the way you love one another. Not by anything else. It's, it's all about the love. If someone wants to be led into your faith, what do you do? The first thing I would do is be Francis of Assisi. Preach the gospel continuously. Use words where necessary. I mean, the first thing is, it's not just about trying to bludgeon them with a, a, an actual theological understanding. Hopefully, you've drawn them in with the, the uh, affect of your life, that they see something in you that is different from others, that they're drawn to you, they're attracted to you, they feel safe with you and comfortable with you. What is it that you have? And then you share your faith with them. I would do the same thing that any evangelical would do, is just share your faith. What is it? Scotty is great at this, you know. He has a line, what if it were true, you know, that these things are true in your life? How would that change your life? You know, it's kind of like that. It's how, this is true for me. This is what I'm convinced of. Let me tell you about it. Well, what then do I need to do to be part of, you know, the, the faith? or part? Okay. This is where the sinner's prayer comes in. And it's not that the sinner's prayer is invalidated. It's absolutely necessary. What the sinner's prayer is, is a formulaic way of just admitting that you're powerless. First step of AA, right? Admitting that you're a sinner in the sense that you're not perfect, that you need help from the outside, that you need help of a higher power to be able to just live life and bring your life back to manageability. The sinner's prayer is that admission, a cry for help, and a willingness to submit to a power greater than yourself. That's what the sinner's prayer is all about. It is the absolute necessary first step for fundamental change for anything that we do, whether it's religious and spiritual or not, until we hit that point where we're willing to lay it all out we're willing to stop defending ourselves and stop trying to create circumstances where we're in control, but actually allow a power greater than ourselves to suggest things to us that we're actually going to follow. That's the beginning of it. And where we may part company is that I don't believe that the sinner's prayer is in any way a prerequisite. And the actual saying of the sinner's prayer, the formula itself, is a prerequisite to salvation. It's a sacrament, if you will. It's a ritual, which means it is the outward expression of an inward transformation. We're always talking about sacraments that way. 
And that's important to understand. It is the person who sanctifies the prayer. The prayer doesn't sanctify the person. It never works that way. And it's going to be the same thing with baptism. Baptism is another beautiful sacrament where in the face of our community, you are going down into the waters. You are symbolically going down into the depths. You are dying. You're going into the belly of the beast, right? It's all that descent, and then you come up the other side. It is a public proclamation of your faith and your willingness to continue on in your faith. Is it necessary? Not in a superstitious way, but it's a beautiful sacrament. Again, an outward expression of an inward transformation. So I would do the same thing that you're doing. I would lead them down this path and say, this is what Jesus is about. This is how he is calling us. This is how we need to respond if we're ever going to be able to follow him in the kind of life that he leads, which is completely selfless in the sense of being other-centered, losing self in the relationships around us, motivated by the good of everyone and everything around us, leaving people better than we found them rather than our own personal advancement. All of that speaks to this ability to let go, which is what the sinner's prayer and baptism both represent. And so there is, they are beautiful rituals that can take us further down that path. But I would explain to them what the ritual represents, what the sacrament represents, what is the meaning behind it, so that they are in tune with that. And they don't, in a passive way, just understand it as, I have done this now, and power outside of myself is flooding in. No, it's the power is already here, and we are engaging with it. We are entering into it. And so it's the same thing, but with a little different understanding. Um, is that a, enough to, to at least answer the question? I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to convince you of anything, of course. No, I'm just trying to bring it. The question was, how, if someone came to you and said they wanted to be a Christian, what would you do? That's what I would do. I would lead them the same path, but I'd be explaining the path to them. You know, the most significant mass I ever attended was a mass at Sarah Retreat by Emery Tang, where he explained every single little thing he did, every, every chalice and cloth and everything that he used. He explained and the, sense, the uh, symbolism behind it. It just made the mass come alive in a way that I hadn't experienced in 30-some years at the time. Because we lose the meaning of our symbols. And the sinner's prayer and baptism are really important milestones along the path toward our spiritual formation and maturation. But we need to explain why they're important and what they're actually doing. And so that we end up being active Christians, engaged Christians, not passively waiting for death or the, or the rapture to be able to take into our reward. There is something that we're supposed to be doing in the meantime. Okay. Just one comment that my, one comment that Tina whispered in my ear uh, is believing that Jesus is the Son of God a part of what you're trying to explain to me? Absolutely. In a sense that Jesus and the Father are one, identical, and the same. Now, we can have theological differences about how that came to be, how that came to pass. Was he born that way? exactly understood himself as son of God, as an infant? Did he grow into that? Did he have to remember who he was? To me, that's what the scriptures are showing us, that he had to grow in wisdom and stature. He had to go into the wilderness. He was compelled by the spirit to go into the wilderness to be able to strip away, be stripped from the, the, the threeness, the, the complete spectrum of human compulsions and obsessions and, and needs. But at the end, when he comes back and he says, I and the Father are one, when you're looking at Jesus, what did we just talk about? When you're looking at Jesus, you're looking at God. You're looking at the Father. That, absolutely. Theologically, how that mechanics of that, I haven't got a clue. And it doesn't matter to me. Because all I need to know is that Jesus and the Father are one. When I'm approaching Jesus in the Gospels or in my life, I'm approaching the Father. It's the same thing. And I can know what that is. And I have something to hang on to because it's in human form. And I also have something to work toward. Because Jesus said, these things you see me do, you can do, and greater things than these. Okie doke. All right. I'm sure there's going to be more. What? Okay. 
Okay, can Tina go first and then you? Okay. It's pretty quick. It's about the scripture that says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And what was the real question? The, uh, oh, the real question would be, does that mean when we die that we are present with the Lord as soon as we are leave this body? Yes. I think that's exactly what he's saying. Now, remember, here, here's, here's the, 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 the subtext of the question was, the people that were now coming to understand Jesus and, and understanding that he was part of the Godhead, these followers of Jesus, especially the Greek ones, and, and well, Greek ones and Jewish ones, whatever, as they're starting to understand Jesus and they're starting to understand the significance of the cross, their question often was, what about my loved one who died before? What is happening with them? And that was a big question because they loved them and they wanted them to be part of this communion of saints and this part of this resurrection of the, of the, of the dead and so on and so forth. And so what Paul is basically saying here, and there, there's more that he talks about here, you know, that the dead will be rise, risen first and so on and so forth. But to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord is his way of also saying it doesn't matter the timing of this, you know. If, if where you died in, in the timeline of this, you're still present with God. And so you don't need to worry about that. And I think that's really the, what he's, the question he's trying to answer with that particular line. I'd have to go back and put it back into context because it's been a long time since I've, I've considered that passage. But as I recall, that would be one of the main concerns. When you read the epistles especially, you're getting the answers and not the questions primarily. And so you have to go back kind of forensically and figure out, OK, what was the question that created the answer? Because the answer is only true, quote unquote, within the context of the question. And that's one of the things that we screw up with, is that we try to overgeneralize these answers that are being given. And we take them into places where they're no longer relevant. But because of the way that we look at the inspiration of the, of the scriptures, that, that God you know, literally wrote every word that we, we tend to overgeneralize. But I think it's really important, especially with the epistles, to realize that he's making some rifle shots here. And we want to make sure that we're getting it back into the context of what the question was asking, because that's where it's going to work. But I think that's the main thrust of it. You know, you don't have to worry. You didn't die, and you're going to be just sitting there in the grave. Because remember, the, the Jewish notion of Sheol was the pit or the grave. And you kind of went there, and it was an undifferentiated place. The evil and the good went to the same place, and they just sort of hung out as shadows. You know, and that's kind of a weird place to be. But what he's doing is trying to get around that cultural belief and say, no, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present to the Lord. You don't have to worry about that. You're not going to go to some weird place. You're going to be with your God. It's meant as a comfort. OK. Nina. Well, let's get a mic over there. Phil, there he is. Thank you, Scotty. Um, I guess it's just more of a comment. And of course, it's all about perspective. But I think about the earliest followers of Jesus weren't Christians. They were followers of the way. And I really like that so much because that's how a lot of it is how do we identify to the world because labels are so confining. The moment you have a label, it's everything you are and also everything you aren't, and it's very divisive. So anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. Um, not really a question. Ah, but it's a great one, you know, one that we made here a lot. You know, how, sig how significant is it? When you think about it, the first followers of Jesus, what did they call themselves? Isn't that important? I mean, what you call yourself, the way you identify your group is hugely important. And we just kind of brush over that. The followers of Jesus weren't called Christians until probably sometime in the second century and beginning in Antioch is was where the label was first applied. Paul, one of, uh, I think it's Acts or one of Paul's epistles talks about that, that they were first called Christians there. And by then, it was primarily a Gentile movement. But the very first Jewish followers of Jesus called themselves Talmidi Urha, or followers of the way, right? That path, that journey. Same word that we were just parsing a few minutes ago. The method of the journey. That's what they're following. I like to say the shape of the journey. That's what they're following. Not followers of Jesus, followers of the way. How important is that to see? I think we, I read something a while back where 
uh, Richard Rohr was talking about, you know, we spend more time worshiping Jesus than we do actually following him and worshiping him from a ritual point of view and maybe from an intellectual and theological point of view rather than just following him. Jesus is much more interested in us following him than praising him in any other way. We praise him by following him. The first followers of Jesus, those first Jews, understood this, and that's how they identified themselves. And that is tremendously important if we want to understand what the thrust of Jesus' teaching was to those first hearers who heard him face to face. What they got from him was that we got to do this. We got to follow this. We have to take that same shape of the journey, that descent down, that stripping away so that we can see the truth that makes us free and then come up the other side. That's the only way this works. It's the only way to the Father. No one comes through the Father except through the shape of that journey. And Jesus is that way. He is that journey. He is that truth. And he is that life. He's identified with it. Perfect. Oh, no, a lull? Really? <laughs> Get that man a microphone. Jim, all the way on the other side, of course. I think this is a, um, a resurrection question, or no, it's actually a crucifixion question, that I've read, and I don't, I may have some of the words wrong or incorrect, but that when Christ died, the curtain in the temple was torn, I believe, from bottom to top, not from top to bottom. I don't know if that's right or wrong, what I'm saying. Um, I think I've read that the temple collapsed. I mean, it was, there was almost an earthquake at that moment. And, and the real question I have is, is um, there's, there's, in the Bible, it talks about the dead rising. Was that was that at the moment of his death? Yes, or, I believe so. Can you talk about that? I mean, it's it's hard. When is that ever talked about? <laughs> you know, it's um. I don't even know when I read that or how many years ago that was. But, um, and, and and the other thing too is if something that dramatic happened. I mean, if that happened today in 2023, I think it would change the world. I mean, that would be unheard of. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's barely remembered, talked about. Um, you know, it didn't seem to make that much of a, uh, a change in the world. Um, I mean, did the Romans flee at that point? Did, you know, what did it really change? So it's multiple questions here. And, and they're, they're, they're good questions, because um, if all of that really did happen, uh, wouldn't there have been more of a fuss? And wouldn't there been, have been some um, contemporaneous accounts of that? We don't have any. Josephus is, is the source. He was a, a Jew who was also a Roman collaborator. Um, but he was, his antiquities uh, is a history that gives us the most information. He doesn't give us much about Jesus at all. He mentions him, although more liberal scholars say that that was a later addition, that he didn't mention him at all. It's really hard to know when you get into ancient documents you know, what was original, since we don't have any of the original documents. And we wouldn't even know one if we found one at this point, most likely. Um, to know what was original. But in his histories, um, we don't see any of that. We don't have any mention. Uh, the temple didn't, didn't fall. There was an earthquake. The, the curtain was ripped from top to bottom in the, uh, in the Holy of Holies. Um, but that's very symbolic, of course, because the whole point of, of Jesus' death on the cross and the, the, the new um, covenant that he's ushering in at this point, which is all about love, is erasing the separation of the people from the God's presence. That's what the curtain separated. It separated the Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant was kept and God's presence was actually palpably located from the outer part of the, of the inner temple. And then there were doors to the outer. So that curtain was only traversed at intervals by the by the priests themselves. And uh, legend has it that they tied a cord around them so that if, if they were unworthy of being in God's presence and were struck dead in there, you could pull them back out without having to, get, having to go in yourself. But um, 
But that's highly symbolic of that erasing of that separation between all of us, all of the people, and God's presence. Did it actually happen? I don't know. You would think that if it did, it would have been a bigger deal because this is no just simple curtain we're talking about here. That sucker was about nine inches thick and had many layers. It was a huge, big deal. And, uh, and the earthquake, of course, and yes, they're talking about graves opening and, and the dead coming forth. Did all that happen? Or is it metaphor again? Is it a way of trying to get people to understand the significance here? Because one of the things that is most difficult for us, and I, and I understand this, is that we believe that something is true if it's accurate, and if it's accurate, it's true. That's the Western way of logic. It's the law of non-contradiction, right? You go from premise to conclusion in a straight line, and only one thing can be true at a time. But to the ancients, accuracy and truth were not the same thing. You could play with accuracy in order to get a truth, especially a spiritual truth, across. And so they played with numbers all the time, for instance. You know, the number of, of contestants on a battlefield are, are, are rounded to significant numbers. The two genealogies of Jesus are telescoped, as, as uh, scholars understand, to come to significant numbers. And so when you look at the genealogy of Jesus from Matthew, which is trying to show that he was a descendant of David, you see that all the numbers add up to 14, or they're, they're, they're uh, sevens and 14s, because 14 is the gematria of the word David, or David. That means adding up the numbers of each of the letters the numeral equivalents, and so you have 14, and that's showing us something. Does that mean that the genealogy is accurate? No, it's not. It's been telescoped, but in order to get across a spiritual truth and, and a more important truth. Is that what's happening here at the crucifixion? I don't know. I can't tell you. But I can tell you what the most important part of those details are. It's to tell us about the power of Jesus, to tell us about what the cross was doing in erasing the separation between God's presence and us, bringing us into intimate connection, and, and, and just the putting him in the same realm as, as those who conquered nature. When Jesus makes a sea crossing, it's because Moses made a sea crossing. Does that mean that that actually happened? Did he really calm the storm? The, the point is, is that he comes in that same power. He has that same relationship with God and then with us. And so you have to decide for yourself. It doesn't mean that the metaphorical or the symbolic meaning is, is uh, obviating or, or just wiping out the literal meaning. The two can work together. But for us here 2,000 years later, the most important meaning for us in terms of leading our lives and understanding the relationship we have, both with our scriptures and our God, is going to be the spiritual meaning. And so we can focus there, and then you all can decide how much you want to take literally and what you don't, because I'll have no quarrel with that. But let's, let's make sure that we're getting the main part of the meaning. Is that OK for now? Okay, uh, yeah. Question. <coughs> Next month at Capitol Beach Church, they have the Tabernacle, which is an immersive experience where Jamie Whitaker took the cubics and everything according to what the Bible said and has it just, I mean, where you walk through it and you have earphones and it goes step by step by step along with going into... Um, I'm sure it's really good. Yeah, yeah so uh, it's something. Uh, OK, what she's talking about, for those of you who are on, uh, on camera, yeah, is that uh, they're uh, at a church called Capo Beach Calvary. They have a reenact or a re, uh, kind of a rebuilding of the actual um, the Holy of Holies in the, in the temple. Is it the tent or the tent of meeting? OK, it's the tent of meeting um, that was before the temple was built. And it has the Holy of Holies and all the pieces. And you have a guided tour. So she's just saying if you wanted to take that, you could, because it will give you a clear idea of what this all looked like, as much as we can recreate, right? Yeah. Um, Sharon. Wait. Uh, again. Microphone. Oh. <laughs> Mine, again, is not really a question. Um, it's more, I guess, semantics. Um, you've talked a lot about John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Um, and focused on the word so as being kind of 
you don't like that word because it shows a measurement of God's love, which is inaccurate because it's unmeasurable. I have always found I focus on the word so in that passage. Um, when I read it, so um, does mean a measure of God's love because when I read for God so loved the world, world that he gave his only begotten son, I think of if I gave my son, it would be everything. I would give, that would be me giving everything. So I look at for God so loved the world as literally his measure is everything. He, everything of God was given to us. And that's the word so for me. Um, so th that is just a different look at that particular word. Um, that's always been a focus for me as a very positive thing. Okay, and, and, and that's fine. You know, if, if, if your understanding of for God so loved the world gets you to that place of, of being able to completely trust the allness of God's love, then you're there. That's it. My, my point, of course, is that the word that is translated as so does not mean how much. It just means how, such, or in what manner. If they wanted to say how much, they would have had to use a different word. So the way that the, the word comes out is, is the actual word that is there, both in Greek and Aramaic, does not mean how much. I thought that was significant because as soon as you put degrees to God's love, that means there can be greater or lesser. And as soon as we're on that hamster wheel, we're back into, did I do enough? You know, does God love me enough? Have I uh, um, acquired enough of God's love? And now we're back trying to measure that, and that's always a losing proposition to understand that this is the way, this is the manner in which God loved. He gave his only begotten son, the son of his unity, so that we would not perish but have life eternal, life that is eternally abundant. And to me, that's a clear way of understanding that God's love is completely degreeless, completely indiscriminate. You cannot attenuate it in any way. It just is. And you either approach it or you don't. Any sense of attenuation of God's love is on our ability to accept or not, and not a, on God's withholding or in any way parceling it out. But, honey, if you're already there, then it doesn't matter. You know, understand yeah, it any in, way you want. We end up in the same place. We ended up at the same place. Yeah, exactly. And that's great. And that's the thing, you know, a lot of times some of the things that I say might sound jarring, but if we actually talk through them enough, we find out we're pretty much in the same place. It's just a, a different understanding. And there's usually a method in my madness. If I am going to take the time to make a distinction like so, it's for a particular reason. The first casualty of any performance-based thinking, the first casualty of our human cognition and, and uh, egoic mentality is going to be to chip away at the notion of God's love. That's the first thing that goes out the window. And as soon as it does, as soon as it becomes anything less than perfect, we're back on that hamster wheel of trying to acquire enough of it to be saved, enough of it to be accepted. And that is the antithesis of what Jesus' good news is all about. Jesus' good news is that this love exists right here and right now. And the only thing that you need to do is get rid of everything that disallows you from seeing it and the allness of it and the freeness of it. And that will take everything you have, but it's your choice. But you cannot change the fact of God's degreeless love. That's good news. And so anything that's going to be chipping away at that, you're going to find me on the other side banging on the door. So just, just, just know that. <laughs> but it doesn't sound like it's your problem, so that's great. All right, we're at quarter two. Tell you what, I have a few more um, on the page that I didn't get to. Well, it sounds like we're kind of um, petering out on the questions. Do you want to do one more Sunday of this? Yeah. Do you have more questions? Yes? Yes? yes. yes. Okay, let's do one more Sunday. And, um, and, and those of you uh, who are remote 
or don't want to actually ask the question or would like to remain anonymous, keep feeding me your questions and I'll bring them like I did today. And then uh, think of questions and speak them out. And if you just want to, to comment or to rebut, you know, do that because that's perfect. That's the way that we learn more. If, if, if everybody's agreeing with me, then I'm the only one thinking, right? And that's not right. I love the fact that we disagree. I love the fact that we move. That's how we actually move the ball forward. So don't be afraid. Be kind, <laughs> but don't be afraid. All right. Father, thank you so much. Mother, thank you so much for this time that we had together. It is, it is just incalculable how much this helps, the sense of community and safety to be able to talk and just work through the things that are so difficult for us as human beings. So thank you for this. And thank you for this community that for 15 years has been able to remain this place of safety and this place of connection and communion. Uh, we're all so grateful. Father, that you have helped shepherd us through and, and continue to make this room available. So thank you, Lord. Thank you for your love and constancy. Never let us forget we can only love because you loved us first. In Jesus' name, let's all stand. <laughs>